Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Ash. I work at Firestorm Books and Coffee. And tonight I have the pleasure of introducing a really fascinating and timely converse conversation between our panelists, Chris Stedman and John Paul Stammer. They'll be discussing Chris's new book, IRL, Finding Realness, Meaning and Belonging in Our Digital Lives. Um, before we dive in, I just want to take a second to share a few bits of information. For folks who aren't familiar, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a collectively owned radical bookstore and community event space in so-called Asheville, North Carolina. We've been around for 12 years now and have a focus on queer, feminist, and anarchist voices and culture but we also have a diverse inventory of general interest titles and host a spectrum of writing on political thought, action, history, and theory. As an event space, we host a wide range of readings, workshops, film screenings, and presentations, as well as meetings for various grassroots community organizations. However, since the start of the pandemic, our doors have remained closed to the public and we've shifted our operation to a mostly online virtual space, which feels very relevant to our discussion tonight, um, but we'll get there. Um, so we are still very much selling books online and tonight's feature title, IRL, can be purchased directly from our website and shipped anywhere in the United States. Um, we've also had a lot of success in converting our community programming to online virtual events. And if you're wanting more opportunities to attend these kinds of panel discussions, as well as other author events and book clubs, or you just want to appreciate the work that we do and ensure uh, our continued existence, you can sign up for our Community Sustainers Program on Patreon, where a small monthly contribution helps support us to continue putting resources towards creating content like this, as well as offers you a 10% discount on all purchases from our store. And if you're interested in attending future events, um, you can stay up to date with our website's community calendar We've got a really exciting event coming up um, with the Working Class History Collective next Thursday, February 25th at 7 p.m. about their new book covering everyday acts of resistance and rebellion. Um, I think a lot of folks here would really enjoy it, so you should definitely check it out. And what I'm going to do is I'll drop links for all of these things in the chat and in the comment section for those who are following on the live stream. So yeah, um, as I said earlier, tonight's conversation uh, features a discussion between Chris Stedman and John Paul Brammer about Chris's new book, IRL, Finding Realness, Meaning and Belonging in Our Digital Lives. Um, and I gotta say folks, I really recommend this book. Uh, I took the last couple of weeks to read through it and let it digest and the layers kind of just keep peeling off. Um, Chris is a really wonderful storyteller and relatable writer and I found myself and a lot of my life experiences to be reflected in a lot of what he puts on the table with the book. Um, so if you have not had the chance to read it yet, I really recommend grabbing a copy and checking it out. I think it's super relevant to all of our lives in this moment. Um, yeah, one more, one more note before I officially introduce the panelists and hand it over to them. Um, I just want to take a second to talk about the tech for folks who are in attendance. We are using Zoom webinar to broadcast this event. Um, so Chris and JP will be on screen and talk for about 45 to 60 minutes. Um, and then we'll open it up uh, if folks have questions um, for Chris or about the book. Um, and attendees on Zoom can submit questions throughout the discussion using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. 
Uh, so there's no need to hold back if there's something that catches your attention um, while JP and Chris are talking, you can just submit your question through that function uh, and we'll see it on our end and folks can answer it. Um, so cool, with that, I'll go ahead and introduce uh, tonight's panelists. So we have Chris Stedman, who is the author of IRL, Finding Realness, Meaning and Belonging in Our Digital Lives. It's the third time I've said it. Um, and 2012's Faithiest, um, and has written for publications including The Guardian, The Atlantic, BuzzFeed, Pitchfork, Vice, Lit Hub, The LA Review of Books, and the Washington Post. He currently teaches in the Department of Religion and Philosophy at Osberg University and serves as the network of ELCA colleges and universities visiting a lecturer. John Paul Brammer is a writer and artist based in Brooklyn. He runs the popular advice column, Ola Papi, and has a memoir of the same name coming out with Simon and Schuster in June. Congrats on that, John. Uh, and he runs a print shop with his original artwork and you can learn more at jpbrammer.com. Uh, so Chris and JP, thanks so much for being here tonight and the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> thanks so much for having us. Uh, JP, thanks for being here <laughs> with me. Um, no. <laughs> to do. You're just you're cursed to spend the rest of your days talking to me. Here we are uh, again. Here we are again. Well, I was just thinking, Chris. Well, you know, I've read this book and I love this book, but I think what would really set things off on the right foot here is if you read some of it aloud. Um, so, if there is an excerpt that you would like to share, I'm all ears. Sure. Oh yeah, you excited to hear some some more of this book that you yes yeah okay so i'm i'm just gonna read like the first three pages of the book um so this is from the first chapter of the book which is called amateurs what does it mean to be real realness has always been a slippery concept one so big and complicated it's dealt with as a central problem in religious traditions like buddhism and christian science but it feels especially loaded these days in our ever more digital lives when the platforms we increasingly use to connect, express ourselves and find information are so often cast as fake. The already inherently difficult question of realness, how can I know who I really am, feels almost unanswerable now. Given the impossible immensity of the question, there are many places I could begin. I start with a drag show. It was amateur night at a gay bar when performers just dipping their toes into the drag waters get their start. I was newly single and begrudgingly following friends' advice to put myself back out there. Like many of the queens on stage that night, I felt very much like a novice. A woefully out of practice flirt, I mostly kept to myself. Whenever I glanced up from my phone, I focused almost entirely on the gritty glittering performers. New to the stage and not yet sure what the crowd would reward and what it would reject, many of these amateur queens were boldly, unapologetically messy. Others were more like me, broadcasting the same tentativeness as my furtive glances away from the glow of my phone screen, unable to hide the nervousness behind their masks of generously applied makeup. Tip for the uninitiated, the makeup on your face needs to match your neck. From cocksure to crushingly insecure, the queens were all over the map. But there was a magic in the messiness of Amateur Night, its combination of audacity and naked vulnerability that overtook me. Maybe it's how chaotic my own life felt at that moment. My boyfriend of nearly five years had just moved out of the apartment we shared. I was navigating challenges at work and everything around me seemed uncertain. Whatever the reason, something about the atmosphere of the show clicked. It felt more real than many of the more practiced drag performances I'd attended. I could see the queens taking risks, experimenting. I could see their nerves, their excitement, and their courage. It was clear that in both their confidence and their hesitance, they were thinking less about what might earn them a paycheck and more about what they wanted to say. 
none of them exhibited the perfection that was exhausting me in my social media feeds, the digital boasts and brags, the job announcements, engagement photo shoots, new houses, vacations, that made me feel worse about my own life, one that seemed determined not to go according to plan. Instead, they embodied the growing part of me that felt like maybe it was time to tear up the playbook, all the rules about what I should and shouldn't do, what I should and shouldn't value, what made my life matter, what made it real, and try something new. In drag, the concept of realness doesn't necessarily mean what you might think. For many drag artists, realness isn't about trying to pass, to blend in with the crowd without notice, but rather about standing out and apart. By disrupting and shining a light on our assumptions, drag realness can expose that what is most real is in the in-between, in the blurring itself, in tearing up the playbook of gender. The realness of drag is that it heightens, dramatizes, and deviates in order to reveal. It holds up a mirror to us, showing us the gender baggage we inherit and inviting us to discard our conventions. This is what the digital pieces of our lives can do too. If we look at them honestly, they can be a mirror that reveals what we're attached to, what scripts we follow, and what these things say about how we understand ourselves. Our digital drag shows us what our culture considers perfection, perfect beauty, perfect relationships, perfect lives, and then asks if we want to discard these things too. It is a laboratory, a space where we can experiment, a space to try things that might not work, things we're not good at yet, and see what we learn from them. Perhaps the most famous quote about drag is RuPaul's, you're born naked and the rest is drag. We are born a blank slate, and then we spend our lives layering ourselves with costumes, masks, outfits. We all eventually face a choice, live by the scripts we've inherited or forge our own way. At its best, drag shows us the flimsiness of those scripts and how much our sense of self is shaped by the world around us. Only when we see that influence for what it is, as with drag's hyper-realness, its exaggeration, its camp, its humor, can we try another way. The internet shows us the flimsiness of our scripts too, not regarding gender specifically, though sometimes, but rather in terms of what we think makes us real, what makes us human. The catfishes or people who assume an online identity different from who they are offline. The filters, software that alters the shades of, or colors of a photo to enhance it. Um, or increasingly goes further in enabling people to dramatically manipulate their physical appearance. The deep fakes, videos created using artificial intelligence that look deceptively real. The curated digital selves we all create. All of these things fundamentally uproot what we have thought constitutes realness and show how incomplete that understanding was. This uprooting presents us with an opportunity to imagine another way forward. If we let it, the internet can reveal us to ourselves, all the posing and hiding we do, and give us a chance to ask ourselves who we really are, how we see ourselves, and how much of that is shaped by the scripts we've internalized. As a result, we have a chance to write some new code. And I'm gonna stop there. Thank you. So true, Steve. So um, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, so I believe it was already mentioned, but really this book has never been more relevant. And I'm sure, in fact, I know that you couldn't have really predicted we would be in the situation we're in now while you were writing it. So I was kind of wondering, what are your thoughts on that? Like, how does it feel to have this book that you've written become such a, a prescient, I would say, look into what our everyday lives online look like and how have our current conditions sort of, has it changed the way you approach it or is it more like this was baked into the book all along? Yeah, I mean, so when I was writing IRL, I was reading a ton. Um, and like most of the books I was reading were about, you know, the digital age, right? Were about social media um, and the sort of different, you know, takes that people have on it. Uh, I wanted to get a, a better understanding of the landscape um, while working on this book. But I read some other books too that um, 
you know, and, and what, what really the book that I think became a kind of guiding light for me while working on IRL was this book called Rising by Elizabeth Rush. Um, it's an incredible book, highly recommend if you haven't read it. Um, and what, um, what Rush does in Rising is basically she is trying to understand, um, you know, this dilemma that we face, um, which is that for many years, we took the land along America's coastlines and we sort of filled it in. Um, we, you know, plugged it up. We, um, we, you know, turned this sort of swampy, marshy coastline land into, um, you know, land where people could build houses and businesses because it was right along the water and so it was desirable. But what we didn't know, um, you know, when that was happening is that it would have this, all of these sort of negative impacts on our sort of broader ecosystem, right? That the coastlines, marshlands, um, that swampy land has a really important role to play. And so now um, people are trying to um, sort of restore what was lost. They're trying to, um, you know, re restore this land back to, to sort of marshland. And so this, in this book, she sort of takes you on this journey as she tries to understand um, this issue better. But she, what the book really is, is I mean, it, it's, it is that, and um, it's a brilliant look into that issue, but it's also a book that's about, you know, how do we sort of prepare for a future that we can't anticipate while also trying to restore what we've lost. And that really became this sort of like, model for me because I think IRL in many ways is my attempt to try and make sense of like how do we restore what's been lost in this into this shift in to a more digital time because we all feel it we all feel the things that we lose when we have to you know when we're doing things virtually instead of offline but also how do we sort of prepare for this you know as the world becomes more and more digital how do we prepare for this future that we have no idea what it's going to look like and um and anyway, all of that is to say in that book, she um, quotes this line that she found in an essay on Alzheimer's and I end up citing that in IRL as well. And the line is sometimes the key arrives before the lock. And I think the phrase really jumped out at me honestly, because as you know, I was um, taking care of my stepdad with who has Alzheimer's at the time. So I think that was a big part of why it jumped out to me. But when I look at IRL now, it feels like, you know, for years, as you know, I was just like obsessed with this question of like, how is the internet impacting our understanding of who we are? And um, in some ways it feels like this key, um, for me, it has felt like this key for a lock that I didn't know was coming, which was the, the pandemic where I was gonna have to suddenly, you know, move so much of my life to the internet, not out of choice, but by necessity. And I feel really fortunate because I think so much of the research and reflecting and stuff that I did while working on this book has really served me during this pandemic. It's not as if like, oh, and as a result, I've had just this amazing <laughs> last year. I mean, you know, it has not been, but I do think that, um, you know, of course, IRL would be a, a different book in some ways if I wrote it, knewing, if I know knew the pandemic was coming, but um, one of the things that has felt really heartening um, is that other people who have read the book, I've heard the, sort of similar things from them. Just as for me, I think it really sort of helped prepare me for a time of, of having to move huge parts of my life to the internet um, and, and, you know, wanting, to, wanting those things to still feel in some way meaningful and fulfilling. Um, you know, I, I definitely feel grateful that um, I had sort of all of this opportunity before the pandemic came to reflect on that stuff. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, I, again, I, it's really, <laughs> it's really hard to write a book about the internet, right? Because it's changing literally every second. And the right. internet we have right now is 100% different from the internet we had a year ago. And so that's where I didn't really try to write IRL as this kind of like, how to guide. Um, I think that those books have some value to play. It's like, there are those books that are like 10 simple steps to, um, you know, clean up your digital life or whatever. And I think that those books have a value, but they also have a really limited shelf life because that the recommendations are not going <clears> to 
make sense five years from now. But I think taking the approach that I try to model in IRL, which is the same kind of approach that um, Elizabeth Rush took in writing Rising, which is this, you know, trying to sort of understand something that is complicated, that is changing, and to understand what your relationship to um, that thing is, you know, that was the approach I tried to take. And um, so I, I do remember, and you probably remember this too, in the earliest, I was doing final edits on the book in the earliest sort of days of the pandemic. And I definitely remember feeling like, do I need to change anything? But it right. felt so early at the time. Um, but I also felt like as I was going through it that, you know, fortunately, I think it it just speaks to whatever kind of internet you have in any given moment, whether it's one like the internet we had a couple of years ago or one now where the internet is, you know, much more a part of our lives. Um, I still think bringing the kind of like intention and self-awareness um, that I think IRL advocates for um, is, yeah. is valuable. Well, one thing that really stands out about your book and it kind of separates it from a lot of the other literature about the internet out there is that whenever I approach a piece of writing about the internet, I'm already primed to read something negative. I'm already primed to read about how it's wrecking my brain, how it's making us all worse people, how it's creating bad habits. Uh, I'm, I'm ready for the bad news. And while I wouldn't describe this book as like, you know, 100% optimistic all the time or like in an unearned way I would say that I left with a more positive feeling about my identity on the internet than I was really prepared to so I was wondering you know how does it feel would you consider this book to be an optimistic book um it's so funny because that is a thing that I have heard and maybe I just wasn't um I don't know in my mind like I'm not a very optimistic person. And so I didn't really think the book was that optimistic. What I think, so I think what happened is when I started writing the book, I, was, I had a very cynical view of the internet and how it impacts um, and influences our understanding of who we are. In part because a big part of what motivated me to start writing it was um, this kind of split I was feeling between my digital life and the rest of my life. So you know, I was going through this period of personal sort of tumult, um, as I sort of alluded to in those first few pages I read from where my, you know, my relationship ended, my job ended. And yet the internet was this where I had sort of built my career as a writer. And so I was continuing to kind of post online as if it was like business as usual, like things are good here. And I was, fe I felt this tension and this split between like what I could or couldn't share online. And so I started writing the book wanting to understand that split and that tension. And I was feeling like my digital life, yeah, was making me feel less connected, less authentic, you know, all of these kinds of things. And um, and then as I sort of, I, I went on a sort of several year process of researching, reading, interviewing other, excuse me, interviewing other people, um, and I started to move more toward the center and right when, you know, when it comes to sort of takes on how digital platforms are impacting us, there's the sort of, um, you know, the utopians who say the internet's making us superhumans like more connected than ever before. And then there's the, the sort of apocalyptics who say it's making us more narcissistic, more selfish, more siloed. Um, it's increasing radicalization, all these things. And then there's folks in the middle who say, you know, the internet's not going anywhere. We need to figure out how to sort of reform it, make it, you know, to make a better internet. And that's kind of where I moved was this kind of middle lane. But um, I do think that as, you know, as I'm thinking about it, I think you're right in the sense that what is optimistic about the book is that I open the book by talking about you know, the first chapter is called Amateurs and it's about the kind of value of being bad at something. And I tell a couple stories in that chapter, including like, um, I talk in, in that chapter very briefly about how when I was in high school, my mom said I had to go out for a sport. And so I being very, very unathletic, um, you know, really didn't want to. And so in an attempt at self-sabotage, I went out for the cross country team because I was a terrible runner. I was even, even worse distance runner. 
And so I was like, there's no way I'll make the cross country team. Um, but what I didn't realize it was truly self-sabotage because I didn't realize everyone makes the cross country team. It's one of those kinds of sports. <laughs> and so I ended up making the team. And, um, and so I started doing cross country and when I started, I mean, I was truly like at the back, very back of the pack and, and yet like I kept at it. And by the end of the semester, um, I was not at the front of the pack, but I wasn't at the back anymore either. And I ended up getting most improved two years in a row. Um, and it's not as if by the end of that process, I was like the world's best runner. I, you know, I've never been the world's best runner um, or anywhere near it, but, <laughs> um, but I did end up discovering two things. One, I actually loved running and I still do run. And two, that you actually learn fundamentally sort of different things about yourself when you do something that you're not good at yet. And while I think the internet presents profound challenges, um, especially, you know, the radicalization piece, that's sort of a whole separate conversation that we can get into. Um, but while it presents monumental challenges, while we do lose things that I think are really important, um, we also have this new opportunity in the sense that we're trying to sort of figure out what it means to be human in this brand new space where none of us really know what we're doing or how to do it well. We have this opportunity to learn things about ourselves. And I think that's where my optimism comes from is I think we have a chance to, like I think the internet, people like to refer to it as a kind of funhouse mirror in the sense that it distorts certain things but reveals others. And I think if we actually look in the mirror and see what the internet shows us about ourselves, we actually have a chance and we can figure out sort of what's distortion and what's real. We have a chance to learn things about ourselves that I think are, are really valuable. So it's a that's realistic a optimism. Yeah, well, I, that's aspirationally real. Aspirational even, yes. Um, here's a question that's more, I, I guess, less about the actual content of the book and more about you as a writer. What was your favorite chapter to write? And is it also your favorite chapter in the book? Or are they different? They are different, actually. <laughs> so I think my favorite chapters are the last two. Um, I don't know why, but usually at the end of a long writing project, I feel like I'm just trying to like get to the finish line, like in a cross country race, I'm just trying to like finish this up. Um, but for some reason, the last two chapters I feel like is when I like really hit my stride of what I was trying to do. And really it was because the whole book sort of builds up to those last two chapters. And so, you know, it's sort of, they're, they're bringing home and, and bringing together everything that sort of came before it. Um, so that's probably part of it, but my, the, the most fun to write chapter was the maps chapter of the book, which I believe is chapter four. That's, terrible that I don't know for sure, but we ended up moving around. Um, initially, one chapter was, yeah, yep, chapter four. So um, in chapter four, I basically the whole chapter orients around this metaphor of um, using maps as a kind of metaphor for our digital lives. And that was a really fun chapter to write, both because I, I've always loved maps. Um, and I sort of talk about that in the chapter and why I love maps. but. And so it was just like selfishly, it was really fun to, I went and spent a ton of time in the map library at the University of Minnesota. I read tons of books about maps. I interviewed um, the director of the map library and, and some other map folks. And so it was just like, that was fun for me. But also what I really loved writing about it is I went, um, I went into it thinking of maps as this metaphor for our digital lives in the sense that when a cartographer is mapping a terrain, they, ha um, they have to sort of choose what they show and what they don't show. It's a process of selection and curation, right? They can't include every detail or else the map would be the size of the terrain itself. And so originally I was thinking of maps as this kind of metaphor for the ways that we perform a self online, um, you know, what we choose to show and what we don't show. Um, but what I came to realize as I learned more about maps and um, interviewed different, you know, map makers and cartographers and the director of the map library is that those aren't neutral choices, right? Those choices are informed by the norms of cartography, which are influenced by who, 
who um, pays for the maps, who, um, you know, at, who commissions the maps, um, whose interests do the maps serve. And, you know, likewise, the ways that we document our lives, that we organize, that we connect online are sort of influenced by these, um, the conventions of the platforms themselves, which, uh, you know, have norms that are often intentionally invisible to us um, and that represent interests other than our own. And so it ended up becoming, the metaphor ended up going to a, you know, a, a much deeper place than I actually imagined it would. And to me, that's one of the most fun parts when you're researching and writing something is when it takes you to a place that you weren't expecting. Right. Um, and uh, I think for me, that chapter especially <clears throat> is just my favorite. Honestly, I c I've had the thought since that I could, that chapter itself could have just been a whole book if I, I could just, I could have kept sort of going down that, that path. Um, that's how much I was enjoying it and learning from it. It kind of goes into my next question, which is, you know, oftentimes when people see that you've written a book on something, it means that you've gone into it with a pretty clear point that you want to make and, you know, a really crystal clear thesis on what's going on here. But writing a book oftentimes initiates its own process in terms of what you think about what you're writing on. It introduces a lot of evolution about what you thought you knew and maybe questions about what you didn't actually know. What were some of the surprises about the internet and how you thought about it that yeah. came about while you were writing this book? Yeah, well, there's a, I mean, there are a few things. The First thing I want to say about that is that I think that when it comes to sort of like opinion writing or or like narrative nonfiction that explores like an issue, there are sort of two kinds of approaches. I mean, two very broad kinds of approaches. One is because I remember once talking to a very famous um, writer who I won't name, but who said like he would write a full chapter of a book like when he took a two hour flight somewhere like from takeoff to touchdown, which just blew my mind. But then I thought about what kind of writer he is. And he is a writer who has a point of view that he's trying to get across. Um, whereas, you know, there's also this approach that's kind of like the approach that I described in Elizabeth Rush's book, Rising, where she's saying, this is something I don't really understand. And I'm writing this book to try and figure out what I think about it. And um, that is definitely the kind of writing that I was doing in IRL, which is like, I don't know what I think about the internet sometimes. Sometimes I think it's amazing. And it's, you know, I think about moments when like in my adolescence, when I was a closeted teenager, when it literally saved my life. And then I also think about moments when it's made me feel more isolated than ever. Um, and so, you know, I went into the book really trying to figure out what I thought about, um, about the internet and how it's influencing our understanding of who we are. And yeah, I mean, I just, I was surprised constantly. Um, I think one thing which relates to the, the maps metaphor is that one thing that really surprised me that probably shouldn't was just how, you know, I think when I started working on the, on the book, I had the sense that I think many of us have, which is that the internet is this sort of like public space. And in, and in that sense, it's just this kind of neutral space and we can, you know, and you see the way that it's used by activists to organize, to, you know, build movements, and you think, wow, it's this incredibly democratizing tool. And what I came to recognize, both as I was working on the MAPS chapter and in general, is that, which I think is something that's obvious to many of us, and I think on some level I knew it, but I didn't really sort of absorb how much it's shaped my own understanding of who I am as a person by using the internet. Um, but you know, what I came to recognize is it's not this public space, it's a private space run by private corporations who ultimately have their own best interests in mind when they are designing these platforms, the ways that they operate them. And so, you know, as the internet has become less this, you know, that the whole idea of in real life emerged because at one point, the internet was this kind of discrete activity that you would step into and step out of. I remember biking to the library in middle school to log on to the shared public computer for a 20 minute window before it was someone else's turn. And so that would be my online time for the day. And then I would go back to the rest of my life. Whereas today the internet is, you know, woven into 
basically every moment of my day in some way or another. And so, you know, now the internet is a, is not a kind of activity that I do. It's a part of how I fundamentally construct myself and, and share, you know, who I am with other people. And so, and I'm doing that in a space that is sort of deeply shaped by these private interests um, that, and, 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 you know, what they see as being important to share is what I end up sharing online, which then becomes this sort of mirror reflecting myself back at me. And, and so, you know, I think that for me was one of the biggest surprises. And, and what I ultimately identify in the book is I think the sort of biggest hurdle to having an internet that makes us feel more like ourselves rather than less like ourselves is that, you know, we need an internet that ultimately is not, you know, profit driven. Um, one mm -hmm. that is truly public space. Um, and I think I was surprised by how, I think, you know, I considered my, you know, I was like, well, of course, this is a part of my politics. I, you know, I think that um, the, the fact that these private corporations run these platforms and have so much power is bad, but I don't think I realized just how centrally that is the, the kind of core problem of the internet that we have right now until I was working on the book. One thing that your book kind of hits at that I think is a pretty, um, pretty much a revelation in terms of internet usage is kind of internet hygiene or social media hygiene, the idea that like, you can use these platforms and it doesn't have to be inherently negative, but there is a way to go about using them that is maybe healthier or maybe more fruitful or maybe allows you to engage in a more meaningful way. And I was wondering if you could share any of the practices that you implement in your daily social media use that could sort of, I don't know, have helped you or helped you like survive on the internet. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think like, I definitely wanna be clear that this is still like something I'm figuring out in real time. I definitely didn't come out on the other side of working on IRL being like, I am, I'm, I've mastered the art of social media use um, or healthy social media use, but, um, Related to something I was just saying, you know, one thing that I, I definitely came to realize and that I think is a really important practice, and I know this is something you practice too. Um, so I, near the end of working on IRL, I took a three month social media break, um, just to focus on finishing the book, but also because I'd spent the entire time working on this book being very online. And so I thought well, I probably need to step back and, and be offline for a minute. And I'm sure you remember when I first got offline, it was like torture. I was totally going through withdrawal. I was like texting my friends in, in meme format and tweet format. And like, I, I felt completely disconnected and that, but then, you know, as time went on, then I felt amazing. Um, I felt like I was, you know, I felt so much less anxious. I realized that so many of the things that I, that had caused so much distress in me were completely trivial, um, you know, uh, and, and it would seem to sort of like, initially I felt like, oh, this kind of confirms this idea that like more time online makes you more unhappy. But what I realized was that it was like being on a meditation retreat. If meditation's your thing, it's not really mine, but you know, if you're, it's like being on a vacation or on a retreat, you are disconnected from the world. And so of course you're less anxious. You're not confronted with other people's reality. You only have to think about yourself and your own needs and and so of course that's gonna feel, you know, you're gonna feel more at ease. Right. But ultimately, you know, part of what it means to be me is to be engaged with the world, is to be aware of what's going on around me um, and, and to be sort of plugged in and connected. But I also do need times where I am disconnected. And while at one point I think disconnection was my norm and connection was a kind of activity like I would log on to the internet and use it for a short amount of time now connection is my norm I'm sort of always plugged in in some way and so I have to actually be really intentional about taking time to step back not because life online is fake or less real or whatever but because I need the perspective I can only get when I'm truly by myself when I am disconnected um, because right now, in the first moment of boredom, I can just reach for my phone. In the first moment of loneliness, I can just log on to Twitter. 
And you know, those platforms as they currently operate um, in a for-profit way are really designed to prey to those on those vulnerabilities, right? They want me to, you know, they're designed to be reflexive in that way. Um, and so I have to actually make a conscious effort to carve out time for me to experience boredom, for me to experience loneliness, because in boredom, in loneliness, there's important data that I need in order to understand myself better. Um, it's when I'm bored or when I'm, you know, lonely that sometimes things that maybe I might be trying to avoid thinking about with my busyness um, arise. And so, you know, I just, I find that I need, I need time offline in order to get perspective that then brings me back into the world. And I know that this is something that you've gotten pretty good at. You're actually a role model for me sometimes in this respect, or you, you will actually like, um, not to put your business out there, but you will like take Twitter off your phone for a while. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. And, and I think that that's really healthy, giving yourself a kind of sabbatical, uh, you know, in order to get some perspective, I think is really important. Um, I wanted to ask you a question that we got in our Q&A here. Um, Sarah asks, are there any social media platforms you found that are less ruled by profit interests like Instagram and Facebook? Well, Instagram and Facebook are probably the worst for sure. <laughs> um, Twitter is not great either, but um, yeah, I mean, the problem is there, these little sort of upstarts will try to kind of like, you know, create a more ethical alternative, but it's really a sort of critical mass issue. It's like um, what I, there's not really any value in me using this tiny little platform if nobody else is using it. Exactly. So uh, unfortunately, like those little, they, yeah, I just- it's kind of like a like, <laughs> catch 22, right? Because for a social media website to be successful, you need a lot of people on it. But once you've got a lot of people on it, you're a successful business. Right. <laughs> so it's just exactly. like- And that's why, you know, we really do need like systemic transformation. We need yep. a public internet in the same way that we have, you know, other public utilities and, um, but yeah, it's, I can't really recommend anything because I know they're out there, but I just don't. And also like, I'm also at the point in my life too, whenever a new social platform pops up, I'm like, I'm just gonna wait and see if it's like actually a thing that people start using. Cause I already like have too many platforms I'm trying to keep up with. Um, can I, I wanna, before we run out of time, you have a book coming out in June. I'm not Thank trying you. to sort of like move away from me, but I am, I guess, because yeah. Do I? Are you sure I have a book coming out? <laughs> <laughs> so can it's out in June, correct? And sure it's available is. to pre-order now. And it's called Ola Poppy. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Um, yeah. So Ola Poppy is a memoir and essays based on the advice column I've been running for a few years now. And <laughs> <laughs> so I am um, I actually my lucky students in my fall semester got to read an early chapter from the book and they're reading the students in my class this semester are reading it as well and um one thing I want to ask you is like now that the book is starting to sort of tiptoe its way out into the world and people are interacting with it um yeah what is like what's the I know it's such a it's such a big question, but what's the thing that you like want a reader to take away from reading Ola Poppy? Hmm. It's I mean, so it's gonna funny. vary from reader to reader, I know, but. Oh, absolutely, but yeah, it, it's very much just like, whenever I write something, I very much just want someone to have a strong reaction to it. I want to communicate something. And it very much is a sort of like, two-way street in that like, yes, I really had this itch to scratch. I had something to say. I had something that I wanted to put out into the world. And now that it's out there, what I would like is for someone to hear it or read it or feel it in some way um, and have that feeling be at least something special. Like it doesn't have to be, wow, this is the best book I've ever read, but I hope it just makes someone think a little bit more about their life or about the things that have happened to them or makes them feel a little bit more empowered or makes them laugh or makes them sad. 
um, my, my bar is pretty low in terms of what I want someone to get out of reading my book. But um, it, it's kind of funny because we were writing our books at the same time. I remember that. Um, you were much farther along than I was, <laughs> for sure. But it's, it's just funny to me that we ended up in this space right here where it's sort of like both our books are kind of, I mean, mine's not fully out there, but they're in the world. <laughs> and it, it is in part, in large part, really, because of our trajectories with the internet. <laughs> I mean, if I hadn't taken mine and hadn't done this advice column that was married with um, technology to bring it to grinder users all over the world, I can't imagine this book in this form would exist. So it's just funny to think that our lives have been so shaped by the subjects that you and she wrote a book on. Yeah, our, our careers, our friendship. I mean, mm -hmm. we met, you know, we first met on Twitter and that's definitely been a huge part of our mistake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I mean, I, I guess that is one thing I wanted to, one other thing I wanted to ask you about and you know, well, I'll save my other questions for when your book's actually out, but um, yeah. So I, we were like the times that we were working on our books did overlap and I have like this memory I've, returned to time and time again over the last year of social isolation <laughs> of us sitting in the world's literal cutest coffee shop mm -hmm. in northern Minnesota, sitting across the table from each other, working on our chapters, exchanging drafts with each other. Um, so I feel like I already have a sense of this, but I'm curious what, like, I'm sure the question has come up, like, why take what you've been doing as this advice column, which is like not it's it's not it's not just an advice column <clears throat> and I don't mean that in the sense that just an advice column and advice columns can be really wonderful but it's also very personal it's also very well but why take this thing that has been working so well in this one format and bring it into this other um and yeah I, there's one other thing I want to say but I'll leave it at that for now yeah, I think that I view all my work as being in conversation with each other, even the illustrations and the drawings, you know, they all kind of feel like they're coming from this very central thing in me that sort of produces things and comes up with ideas and has things to express. And to me, it is all coming from the same place. So it's, it's hard for me to question and figure out answers to why I make certain things, because whenever I do end up making something, it's almost like I have to look back and think, why did I do that? <laughs> what possessed me to make that happen? Because, you know, when I'm working on something, uh, you know, this, like, I just get very tunnel vision about it. It's all I can think about. And it just eventually finds its way into the world. And then I have to be like, okay, that was a lot of time and effort and energy. <laughs> why did we do that? Um, so for me, like this column just felt like such an easy way to expand on what I was already doing, which was, you know, writing about these themes of loneliness and feeling like you uh, didn't belong, but also finding ways to take agency over your own story and over the things that have happened to you. Um, those are themes that really proliferate the column. And it was pretty much the easiest thing in the world to be like, okay, now I really want to take the opportunity to make this into a book where I can sort of explicitly write about these subjects on the events and themes that I know really well. Um, yeah, I think that you, it's just, when you were just talking, it reminded me of something that I feel like is so true in my own writing, which is like, so at the end of IRL, I basically like come to, I build to this moment of being like, oh wow, like what I thought my intentions were at the start of the book are not actually like what I was, they're not the real reason I was interested in this topic. And so often like our intentions are are not clear to us until we've sort of gone through that process and come out on the other side. And that's <clears throat> a recognition I've had again with this project I'm working on right now that you know about um, that is still secret. But, you know, I sort of started it thinking I had, you know, thinking I was doing one thing and sort of, it was only on the other side that I came to realize like, oh, this is actually what this was about. But I do think that, what you said in response to the first question is so apt for your writing because the thing I always see like the way that people react to your work is by they have a like people just have such a strong reaction to what you write such an emotional reaction and and 
oftentimes it might not be what they were expecting when they picked up the book, um, you know, or, or when they read the, that week's column. You know, they sort of went in thinking it was going to be this one thing, and then they have this experience they aren't expecting, and it shows them something about themselves. And I think that element in writing, for me, like my favorite writing is always that kind of writing that like takes me by surprise um, when I read something that I think is doing one thing, and then I realize it's sort of revealed something else to me that I wasn't expecting. Um, and so I think that's a big part of why my first book was very straightforward and I'm very proud of that book. I'm happy with that book, but IRL felt like this very, um, I set out this, like my goal for the book was to try and take this very complicated issue of what it means to live online and um, approach it from all these different, like unexpected angles to see what I could find about it. Um, like, if I look at it through the lens of map making, what will that show me about the internet? Um, and I do think like the best thing that, my, like I think my biggest goal for the book was to like give people another way to look at this thing that is so central to our lives. Um, and that maybe if it showed them one or two sort of unexpected things um, or, or made them recognize one or two unexpected things in themselves, like that to me is all, is one of the best things writing can do. And so. I definitely think that's something your writing always does for me um, and why I'm so excited about your book. Thank you. And I really hope everyone here has a copy of yours because it's only gaining in importance. And I think that once we've uploaded our entire brain to social media, it will perhaps be the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, I definitely have no interest in being uploaded to the cloud myself. Okay. Because I do think like, and this is one of the, like one of the biggest tips I can give people when it comes to their digital life, which is something you sort of asked about before, besides taking time to sort of step away from it, which I think is really valuable, is like so much of our experience of the internet has to do with our own expectation management. Like if we expect life online to replicate the thing, the kinds of experiences we can have offline, we're going to always feel like something is amiss. Like, you know, if, it's sort of like, I think I make the parallel in IRL to like the less good vegan meats that are like really trying to like, and I, I love certain vegan meats. I just, I, I eat beyond meat, those beyond meat, hot Italian sausages like every week. But there are some vegan meats that are trying to recreate the experience of eating meat and they get like so close that it's like it. uncanny valley. And it's like mm -hmm. something about this is not right, you know? But then there's things like those oyster mushrooms that we're obsessed with, um, or the, what is it called? Hen of the Woods. Hen of the Woods, yes. Yeah, where it's not trying to sort of recreate this meat experience. It's just its own like really delicious thing. And I think if we let the internet be a Hen of the Woods mushroom, um, rather than expecting it to sort of be this exact recreation of meat, like there are things about the internet that are you know, that we can never, we could never do offline. You know, you and I are able to have this conversation right now because of the internet. Um, but we shouldn't expect the internet to exactly recreate the kinds of ways that we can connect and express ourselves and understand the world around us offline. Because if we do, then, you know, I think that's when we start feeling like something about this isn't right. Um, at least for me, that's, that's a big part of it, so. Wow, that was poignant and I can't imagine making a better illustration than the one that you just made um using hen of the woods <laughs> i was gonna say now i just wish i was visiting you in new york so we could go to that one place and eat those now i wish i hadn't eaten dinner so i could order it <laughs> tomorrow oh, sounds so good yeah maybe i will tomorrow well chris Dedman, as always it has been maybe not quite a joy <laughs> 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 it's been pleasant enough um <laughs> From you, that's high praise. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me to talk with you about your incredible book. Here it is, everyone. Um, this is my, my, my dream is being a reality talk show host. This is the part where you're on the couch over there and they pan over to me. And I'm like, the book is called IRL by Chris Dedman. It is so, so important. I hope that you all get a copy. Um, go to your local bookstore, order on IndieBound. Uh, is, it, is it available on IndieBound? Mm -hmm. Period. Do that. <laughs> yes. And uh, 
Thank you. You did amazing. You just passed your audition. The TV show is yours. So um, true. But and and thank you so much to our hosts for having us. Yes. Thank well, you. Like, thank you. Thank you. This is the part where the the camera pans back to the host. Uh, <laughs> they take it away. But yeah, thank you and thanks everyone for coming tonight. Yeah. Thank you both for this really great conversation. Um, John Paul, thanks so much for sharing about your book. We'll definitely have to get it on our shelves uh, in June when it comes out. Well, um, love that. Chris, thanks so much. I don't, it doesn't look like we, we have uh, any other questions submitted. You know, I was interested to ask Chris, um, I know there was a, a section in the book that talked about um, uh, religion and sort of the loss of religion that is taking place or, or at least people identifying with religion. Um, and you had a really interesting kind of take on the way in which people um, are turning instead of to, you know, their local synagogue or church or whatever tradition it is that uh, they grew up in um, or religious tradition family they were raised in, instead of seeking out questions about the meaning of life and what it means to be human in those places, people are turning to the internet for those kinds of things. Um, and I think in the start, I alluded to the fact that, you know, that's very much my own experience. Um, so it, it rung very true for me. So I was wondering if you could share just like a little bit more about what, like why that was included in the book and, and what, what you think that means ultimately that, that folks are turning to the online space for those kinds of questions. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm sure some people are like, they hear like professor in a department of religion and philosophy and they're like, well, wait, why, why did he write a book on the internet? And it is, you know, I think my motivation for writing this was both personal. I had these sort of experiences that made me recognize the split in my own digital life that I wanted to explore. But then I also have the professional background that I do where I've been working for the last decade in higher ed, specifically exploring the sort of disaffiliation and, and folks who are leaving religious institutions. And um, for the last couple of years, I've been working with a group of sociologists at the University of Minnesota and UMass Boston to better understand the religiously unaffiliated. And yeah, we're in this, this big culture, this moment of big, uh, sort of a big shift where people are leaving religious institutions. It's the fastest growing segment of the religious landscape in this country. And you know, they're sort of stepping out of the spaces where we've historically wrestled with big questions of meaning and purpose. And what I came to suspect after years of working um, you know, in this, with this population is that more and more of these uh, people, more and more people, especially young people are you know, turning to digital space instead to explore these kinds of questions, to do the kind of self-construction um, and self-exploration that often happens in those spaces. And so I wanted to understand you know, in many ways, the reason people are, the reasons people are leaving these institutions are abundantly clear these institutions often you know have proven themselves to be much more interested in protecting their own interests than in the well-being of of their members of individuals um and yet i think we have this idea that we're sort of and i've felt this myself as someone who left religious institution and now is non-religious we feel as if we're leaving the idea of institutions altogether and sort of making our own way out into the world and um, creating our own sort of structures. But when we move into digital space, really what we've done is swapped one kind of institution for another. We've swapped these religious institutions that provide structure and space to explore these questions. And we're moving into this sort of digital institution, which like these religious institutions have the, the digital space has its own sort of norms and conventions as I was touching on earlier. Um, and, you know, I think for all the reasons that it is, you know, there are many reasons to celebrate this shift that's happening uh, sort of away from these institutions of old um, toward a more sort of both uh, the freedom that it provides for people to be able to kind of make their own way in the world. Um, I think that there is also loss at the same time um, for all the ways that these religious institutions have harnessed their institutional power to restrict and harm people. They also have been able to harness, you know, those structures for very 
positive and um you know say what you will about religion and there's plenty i could say but um you know religious institutions figured out over very long periods of time structures that work that help people regularly reflect on their lives that challenge them to think about how they're living in the world and what their responsibility is to the world around them my mom is philosophically agnostic she doesn't you know she doesn't consider herself a christian but she goes to a lutheran church because she likes having this regular opportunity to kind of check in with herself and, and be challenged you know to like she hears the sermon and then she has to kind of ask herself am i living in the way that i want to um am i living in line with my sort of highest principles and and i think that the kind of accountability structure that religious spaces often provide people that's one thing that we've sort of lost in this shift and um and that was a big part of what irl what i explored in irl is sort of how does the inner like religious spaces can hold, help hold us accountable to ourselves and to the world does the internet do that for us um and in some ways it can um in other ways the internet that we have right now doesn't do a great job of that so um yeah maybe, maybe only twitter twitter <laughs> definitely <laughs> offers that it does look like we have one last question that came in um, there is a question again from Sarah that is, says, what piece of advice would you give young queer and trans people who, especially in the pandemic, find the internet their only major platform for exploration, expression, and community? Yeah, so this kind of goes back to that, the um, institutional piece, you know, I, I write in IRL about how as a young queer person, the internet was the first place where I could really come out to others um, for many reasons. Uh, I didn't feel safe coming out to anyone around me, um, but also there was something about the kind of lower stakes of the internet where you can come out to someone online and if it doesn't go well, you just close out of the window versus if I come out to my mom and that doesn't go well, there's gonna be a lot more consequences that go along with that. And, and so I think, you know, the internet is an incredibly powerful space for exploring, for experimenting. I mean, all throughout IRL, I tell the stories of different people who have used digital space to try out a different aspect of themselves to sort of, you know, um, try sort of coming out in online before coming out offline. And, and so, you know, I think especially for, you know, LGBT people, as well as other folks who, um, you know, wh whether it's like a, a religious identity, maybe someone is living in a um, religiously conservative environment or religiously homogenous environment, and they don't consider themselves that religion, um, they can use the internet to find like-minded other people. Um, so I think it can be incredibly powerful that, for that. But I also think that you need to, you know, um, exercise caution because for as much as the internet can liberate and and provide opportunities for LGBT people to connect with others, it can also be harnessed by people who have, um, you know, bad intentions toward LGBT people. And I've experienced some of the worst, um, you know, queer antagonistic um, harassment that I've experienced in my life online. I mean, I've definitely experienced physical violence offline, um, but, you know, it, the internet, just as it can empower LGBT people, it can empower, um, you know, anti-LGBTQ people. And so I always would urge, especially young people who are using the internet to seek out resources, information, community, to, um, you know, to treat the internet seriously. And that means both to use it as a, as a space where you can be vulnerable with others, something that is incredibly important, but also to, you know, to, to exercise caution for your own safety in the same ways that unfortunately we often have to do offline as well. Um, so I don't think that's a particularly radical piece of advice, but that's one thing I would say. JP, is there anything you would add to that? No, I think you said it so well is the thing that I can't imagine adding anything. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank cool. you for the question, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay, great. Thanks, thanks, uh, Sarah, for those questions. Maybe just one last one. Um, I loved, too, how many, like, other books you referenced 
that were either like parallel um, to some of the work that you were doing or you mentioned rising earlier. I was curious, what were some of the other like influential reads that you did in preparation for this book? Yeah, um, definitely there were, I read a ton of books. Some of my favorites were um, Twitter and Tear Gas, I highly recommend. I cite that one a number of times in the book. Um, From Memes to Movements, that's another really excellent book um, that was so readable um, for a dummy like me. It was very, very easy to understand and, and really expansive. Um, and then, yeah, actually, like I also was reading a lot on climate change as I was working on IRL. Rising is one example, um, but because, you know, she's writing about how they're trying to restore these wetlands at the same time that we know the oceans are rising. And so how do you sort of restore these wetlands that are gonna end up being underwater? Um, and, and yet, you know, part of why I was reading so much about climate change is because like the, the challenges that we experience online feel systemic in the way that the challenges that we experience around climate are as well. It's like, I can change my digital habits and improve my own personal experience of the internet. Um, you know, in the same way that with climate change, I can, you know, get rid of my car, I can recycle more, all these good things that will change my relationship to the planet that will make my experience of living on this planet better. But until, you know, the 100 corporations that are responsible for the majority of carbon output are forced to change their practices on, in a systemic way, you know, my own individual actions aren't gonna change the system. And I'm gonna be swimming upstream just as online, I can change my own habits and practices um, and, and that'll change my experience of the internet, but I'm ultimately gonna be swimming upstream. I'm gonna be working against the current of the algorithms that try to move me in another direction. And so, you know, I think there were a ton of books on climate um, that, and a few that I cite in IRL, but, and that's where I think like, it's, if you're trying to understand something as big as the internet or as climate change, you really have to think about, or there's a lot that you can gain from reading like how we're going about trying to solve other equally large systemic kinds of problems. Um, and so that was definitely something I found valuable while working on IRL was reading up on. Um, although <laughs> I also found myself feeling very dispirited in moments while reading about the climate crisis. But I, th I think it's important to be honest with ourselves about the immensity of the challenge if we want to do anything about it, just as you know, we face really immense challenges with our digital lives too. Yeah, that's all super real. Thanks for tying that in there at the end. Yeah. Uh, well, JP, Chris, thanks so much again for doing this tonight. Hopefully, maybe sometime in the future with another uh, book release, new books, um, <laughs> we can do it again. We can get together and do it again. I would love that. Yeah, that'd be great. All right, y'all. Thanks so much. Have a yeah. good night. Bye. Everyone. Bye.